Welcome back, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner along with J.D. Hayworth on this very special uh, special Newsmax GOP debate run where we go ahead and look at what happened, what's coming up, the numbers and everything. J.D., go ahead and bring our next guest in. I'm happy to do that, but I just have to make one statement. You know, Ed, oh, you were, okay. Go right you ahead. Were, you were asking me before the break, what <laughs> what was new with Donald Trump tonight? What was the breakthrough moment? What, what did he offer that was brand new or detailed? And I don't mean to go Hillary Clinton on you, and I won't do it with you that just kind of did. tone. Remember, here's the <laughs> question what difference does it make here's the point and i said it earlier in the program mm -hmm. when you're leading you don't have to swing for the fences every time you hit solid singles and if you have a constituency you can keep a pretty good chunk of that constituency by staying consistent with vision in the big picture. At any rate, let's swing, bring in, Wait a minute. Swinging for the fences is one thing, but when you can't even make a bunt happen in the, in the game, now that that's, isn't going to help you That's either. where we have a disagreement. He swung and missed. No, he didn't miss. He hit singles. A couple of fielder's choices tonight. But I'll, right give you, now, I'll give you two fielder's choices. All right, Go but ahead. you look at the viewer's choice right there. At any rate, we died. At let's any rate. bring in a guy who, who uh, knows his way around politics. In fact, was working for Donald Trump until recently, joining us via telephone from New York City, the one and only Roger Stone. So, Roger, your take on the Donald, the debate, and the verdict tonight. Who won it? Well, uh, I think they all won, and nobody really turned in a poor debate. I agree with your analysis on Trump. I do think he had his shining moment, his opposition to the Iraq War, um, which was his single best moment in the debate. Uh, clearly, several of the candidates had the knives out for him. I don't think anybody really scored off him. I think he will hold his constituency, and I think he'll continue to lead in the polls. Uh, but uh, if you go across the field, uh, three hours is a long time. Uh, even for junkies like us, it just began to get a little wearing. Um, I do think Ted Cruz had a very strong debate. He scored off the question of Supreme Court justices to the detriment of Jeb Bush. I thought Carly Fiorina had a strong debate, although she seems pretty strident to me. I wonder if she ever really smiles. Um, I did think that uh, Rubio comes across as a little too canned, a little too practiced, a little too regimented. You see, what he's done is to take his memorized stump speech and then break it down into modules that he fits into the answers of the questions. I think it comes across as a little phony. And I also think it is to his detriment that he looks very young. He is, after all, hasn't even served one term in the U.S. Senate yet. Worst moment of the debate for him, basically saying, I'm no longer showing up for work in the job I have now, the U.S. <laughs> Senate, because I'm running for president. Well, at least he wasn't as bad as Lindsey Graham, who said tomorrow we're going to be drinking or something like that. That was even more entertaining in the first segment. Hey, Roger, let me ask you about two guys here then. First of all, Ted Cruz. When you talk about stump speeches here, and I think that's very interesting. Ted Cruz, a lot of what he said comes off stump speeches, basically. He just canned a lot of it into what he said, but he still makes yes. a very forceful argument looking forward. He doesn't say anything new, but he sounds good when he says it. Scott Walker, on the other hand, I thought Scott Walker was invisible, save for just a couple of flash moments here. This had to be the moment for Scott Walker where he would basically save his POTUS possibilities and put himself back on track. Would you agree that he did not necessarily do that? Yeah, I thought he had a slightly better debate performance than the previous Fox debate. Uh, I, you know, Cruz is, is an orator. He is just a strong performer. I agree that his answers are, like Rubio's, out of his stump speech, but somehow he manages to deliver them with greater conviction. I do have one problem with him, though, and that is if you close your eyes and you listen to him, he does sound exactly like Mr. Haney from Green Acres. Well, now, wait a minute. Let's not, let's <laughs> well, not go to TV. At least you didn't say he looks like Mr. Haney. You know, because we could really get bad here. Remember, 72, Roger, you worked for Dick Nixon, and he ran yes, against George McGovern. And come on, let's face it. I mean, I heard from more than one person, and, and George was a great man. You may not have agreed with his politics, although he showed some courage coming out against compulsory union votes uh, late in life. But when you'd close your eyes and listen to George McGovern in 72, his vocal pattern and nasality, I'm sorry, he sounded like Liberace. You know, so yes, he did. Uh, so he, you, he you did have that going like on. Apart from that, though, in all, in all seriousness, I'm interested in pursuing the Scott Walker question for a second because I was, I was mentioning earlier that we're going to have to take a look in the metered markets at the tune-out factor. And we know now, we hear that online people won't watch videos for what, more than, if three minutes is a long time. So if we had an initial huge tune-in, 
They saw Scott Walker very forceful early. If they leave in a half an hour, he's made an impression. No? Well, perhaps. There, I think there's another factor here that I think a lot of, of the pundits are missing, and that is because all of the primaries up to March 14th are proportional. And because of the advent of the super PAC. See, the reason that, that candidates used to drop out after losing a couple early contests is because they ran out of money. Now, with the advent of the super PACs, people can continue to lose but stay in the race. Um, therefore, you could have a long, drawn-out winnowing process in which candidates like Scott Walker, who failed to score in any of these early contests or early debates, nonetheless stay in the race, take up their little piece of, of the turf, um, and we, this contest could go all the way to June of next year to the New Jersey and California primaries in June. It is more than possible. I think it is likely. Wow. I don't think we're going to have a like uh, an early nominee. Well, mindful of that, I want to continue on the Walker theme for just a second, Roger. His people say that when it comes to his support in Iowa, the people who are have, going to have to go out in January, sit through those caucus meetings and vote, that he has a very strong base of support. Contrary to the numbers we see in the Des Moines Register and other polls, they're saying Walker's people are locked in. Are they just putting a brave face on it, or is there something to the mechanics of the Iowa caucus that may bode well for Walker even now when we're seeing these very different numbers in the summer of 2015? Yeah, I don't think the polls are wrong. It is significant that, that Wisconsin and Iowa are contiguous, uh, and there's no question that Walker has spent a disproportionate amount of, of a time there. But Look, it's September of 2015. All of these numbers, including the numbers on the ground, the numbers in Iowa, can change and likely will change. Uh, nobody's really out of this race. Also, conversely, nobody's got a lock on this. And nobody really has a leg up. The, the one underperformer here across the board has really been Jeb Bush, who although he has scored $100 million from Wall Street, seems actually to be moving backwards in the polls. Roger, is it fair to say, and you're right about Jeb Bush, because again, at times he just seemed as if he was still uncomfortable. He still didn't have that push forward that I think a lot of people want to see, which quite frankly just may not be genetically possible for Jeb Bush. But can we not say that if we're going to slap a loser tag on somebody tonight, it's got to be Dr. Ben Carson, because everything you're seeing right now is he was sleepy. I mean, I'm not trying to insult the man. I have a world of respect for Ben Carson, but he was out of his league tonight in more ways than one. Would you agree? Yeah, I liked his suit better than I liked his performance, in all honesty. I thought it was a great suit, but he was, he is, um, he's a ponderous speaker. It takes him a long time to get to the point. Um, he's actually the one who I thought was kind of missing any passion, any real spark. I thought he turned in uh, a weak performance, which is interesting in view of the fact that the most recent polls have shown that he is the candidate who is climbing up Trump's back in both Iowa and New Hampshire. Well, let me ask you that, Roger, if I can, with about a minute left here. And you bring up an interesting point, because the fact that he has been climbing, when in essence he really hasn't made any great speeches, he really hasn't made any great policy promises, he really hasn't come out with, I don't want to say the gotcha moment, but certainly the moment that people want to remember. In your opinion, then, what was it that was driving Ben Carson to get so close, relatively speaking, to Donald Trump? He's an outsider. It's interesting here that three candidates with forward momentum are Fiorina, uh, Carson, and of course Trump. All of them have one thing in common. None of them are career politicians um, with Washington or State House experience. Uh, and they haven't spent their life gorging on special interest campaign contributions like all these other candidates, which I really think is the thing fueling Trump's candidacy. I would have to agree with your analysis. I think, uh, I think he turned in an uneven performance tonight, Dr. Carson. Funny how we didn't even mention Rand Paul. 30 seconds. Why haven't we even mentioned him tonight? <laughs> uh, he, I thought he had a very, very, very strong debate if he were running for the Libertarian Party nomination. Uh, I happen to agree with his views on both war and drug law reform. I just wonder how much currency they have within the Republican Party of today. Roger Stone, always a pleasure to have any of our shows, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sure we're going to speak again real soon. Great to be with my friends there at Newsmax. Many All thanks. All right, buddy. Take care. Uh